Bizarre events and experiences of other beings on BBC Two now in Strange Stories. When I was nine, um, I was in my bedroom reading and I was aware out of the corner of my eye that there was something that shouldn't be there and uh, as I looked up there was this, this creature which would, could only be described as a, a troll-like thing sitting on the chair and it was about a foot high, naked, really hairy, really ugly and, and had no genitals or anything and he said to me, whatever you want, um, I can get for you, anything. I thought, hmm. Now, when you're eight or nine, there's not a real lot that you actually want. So I thought, oh, oh test it. So I asked this, this troll thing to uh, get my mum to come in and to pick a particular cushion up. And there were quite a few. And I said, well, pick that one up and walk out with it. And a few minutes later, my mum came in, picked up this particular cushion, and was almost to the door with it. And I said, Mum, what are you doing with that? And um, she, her face sort of went, um, I, I don't know. Um, I've come in for it for some, for some reason. Uh, um, and she looked really confused. So anyway, she went out, and uh, the troll reappeared, and uh, I said, see, wh whatever you want. I can get that for you, anything. I remember I was climbing up Ben Nevis, going up the Glen, and I came to this ice bridge going across like this, and I could see it was terribly dangerous to actually go over the top. And when I arrived at the bridge, just where I needed it, suddenly, stretching out in front of me, there was a line of footsteps, one, two, three, going ahead and just at the side as if there were a shepherd's crook just going down at the side uh, imprinted in the snow there was this line leading ahead and the extraordinary thing was that before there was nothing and as far as I could see in front there was nothing and I knew that if I put my feet in these prints I'd be able to get over this ice bridge without any trouble at all and I'd be perfectly safe so I did that I went Forward, putting my feet carefully, rather like good King Wenceslas, in the snow prints, and arrived safely over the ice bridge. And I looked back, and to my amazement, there was nothing behind except this one line of prints. And in front of me, going down the slope to Kinloch Leven, there was absolutely a wide expanse of tr totally untrammeled, untouched snow. The prints started and stopped exactly where I needed them. And people have said, well, how did that happen? I've no idea, but I know they were there when I wanted them, and it could well be they saved my life. Really, one could say it was a miracle. It was a dark December night, cold, windy. We moved into the local churchyard across a uh, a, it, through a sunken lane um, I was several yards in front of Sally and I quite literally blundered into the animal I believe I trod on it it catapulted away from me got stuck in a stand of trees and flew back in my direction it hammered into my left shoulder spun me right round and dumped me on the grass it then moved off up the sunken lane in Sally's direction and what happened next was was really quite horrifying next thing I knew this large black cat was charging towards me it reared up on its hind legs uh, took a couple of swipes at me one missed and one caught me on my left side it knocked me into the undergrowth and disappeared into the night I wasn't at the time it appeared to be a large black leopard um, it didn't seem to be anything else. I didn't realise it had done any damage um, until I got back to the car. And then I got just tremendous pain in my left side. Investigated only to find that it had gone through a wax jacket, through a jumper and through a waistcoat. 
and left some tremendous scars which I still have today. Prior to the incident we were very keen walkers and ramblers but I've got to say we're deeply reluctant to take our two small toddlers for walks even in the local woods now. We believe it's a large, powerful, dangerous animal and would advise anyone that encounters one of these animals in the future to treat it with the utmost respect. One fine summer's evening, I was walking on the shores of Gerrans Bay with my brother, who's a high-flown scientist, not given to flights of fancy, when he suddenly drew my attention to something in the water. What on earth's that, he cried. And to my astonishment, I saw an enormous sea creature, sea monster, just offshore about 300 meters from the shore. And we were looking down from a height at an oblique angle. And it had a long neck, an enormous hump, two smaller humps which were muscular. And you could see the muscles ripping as it was propelling itself rapidly along. And then we realized it had got a long tail which was just below the surface and which was as long as the trunk part. Now surprisingly, um, the monster had this long neck and for the size of the animal, a very small head. And in a way it looked rather endearing because it had got its head at a pert angle and its sort of nose in the air. And it was moving very rapidly and very smoothly. It was gliding very fast. And it was quite surprising, in view of the size of the animal, that it was making very little disturbance on the glassy, still surface of the water. We watched for about five minutes. Then all of a sudden, it submerged. And it didn't, as one might expect, put its head down and take a dive. It just went down like a submarine. First of all, the hump disappeared, and there was the neck and the little head. And the last we saw of it, was the little head and the nose disappearing below the surface of the water with scarcely a ripple. Back in 1989, I was in training at the Hendon Police College and uh, I used to come home for the weekends. On the Thursday evening, I phoned my mother to let her know that I'd be coming home the weekend. And uh, on the Friday evening, when I got to the Isle of Sheppey where I live, I went to the high street to get my music papers, which I collected each week, which uh, also entailed me coming into my road from the opposite end, which I normally do. As I got about three quarters of the way down the road, I passed uh, a house where lived an elderly gent, Mr Jenkins, whom I knew quite well, having lived in the road for 13 years. He was standing outside the front of the house, and I said, hello, Mr Jenkins, as I passed him. And uh, he raised his hands to the brim of his hat, nodded, but didn't say anything. Well, strange. Anything. Anyway, carried on, got to my front door, got into my living room, and there's my mother. First thing she said to me was, guess who died last night? No, sorry. She said, Mr Jenkins. And I just stood there with my mouth open, I was totally shocked. I'm a bookseller. I work in the book market on the South Bank in, uh, in London, under Waterloo Bridge. And uh, I was setting out my stall one day. I had a big armful of books, and I was setting them out one by one all along the table. And an old lady approached me, and she came up to me, and she said, uh, you know, what days are you here, and how long has the book market been here, etc. And she was telling me uh, how the area had changed since she last knew it. She'd got married after the war. She'd gone to Canada, and this was her first time back, and everything had changed. She thought it was amazing. And I was talking to her, and I was still laying out the books, and the one I laid out was called The Language of Flowers. And she looked at it, she says, oh, I had a copy of that when I was a little girl. She says, I really loved it. It was a constant companion. I'd love to replace my copy. Looks very similar. And she picked it up and began to look through it, and I carried on just laying out the books while she did it. And when I finished, I looked back, and she was standing there with the book in her hand like this, and her hand, other hand on her mouth, and she was all sort of almost shaking and something was wrong and I went up to her I says what's wrong madam what's what's the problem she said this this is my book she says this is my actual book look it's got my name in it Hetty but she says how did you get the book because this we lost this book in the blitz our house was completely bombed all our belongings we just left them because it was it was just a pile of rubble we never took anything away how on earth did you get this book because it is definitely mine here's a, you know she showed me the little annotations and we were talking about the book and she showed me the little drawing of a bush or a tree or something and she'd put it there in the back so she said oh I've definitely got to have this book I just can't believe it she said 
So she pulled out a purse and was going to pay me. I said, oh, no, please. I said, look, I, honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't take that. Please accept it as a gift from a bookseller because it's a wonderful story. I can die this. About five years ago, my mother moved to a new house in the country. And in the garden, there was a barn which was going to be demolished. And it was full. The, the chap who used to live there was a builder. And the barn was full of bits of old wood and tools and, and lots of wood chippings on the floor. And we're basically having to clear the whole place out, burn it. And, uh, before it could be demolished and uh, the garden was a mess too we had a big bonfire at the end of the garden and I'd taken a barrow load of stuff chippings from the floor I'd taken it down to the bonfire at the end of the garden tipped it on and I was standing there about two yards away from the fire chatting and there was this bang and I felt something hit the side of my head and I put my hand up and I took my earring out of my ear and there was this .22 bullet which had been on the fire and had exploded and cartridge embedded itself in my earring and um, obviously if I hadn't been wearing the earrings it would have got me in the neck and uh, at the time what I was quite freaked out by was the fact that, that it has the letter E on the bottom of it and my name's Elaine and uh, I thought this, this could have been quite literally the bullet with my name on it. I was walking along the road in Folkestone, where I live, and there was a phone box in the street ringing. Um, I don't usually answer phone boxes, obviously, but for some reason I decided to answer this one. Picked it up, and there was a voice at the other end, matter-of-factly, saying, Oh, sorry to bother you at home, Jason, but the fax machine's broken down. You know, can you help me fix it? And it was Sue, who I work with uh, at the AA in Dover. And uh, I sort of stopped her in her tracks and said, Sue, just a second, uh, you rung me in a phone box, you know, how did you know I was here? And she said, oh, stop messing around, Jason. Look, we're really busy. How do you sort this machine out? And I said, Sue, look, I am, I'm in a phone box. You know, how did you know I was here? You know, what are you doing? And uh, you know, she just wouldn't believe me, and I kept trying to convince her and gave up in the end. So I told her what to do with the fax machine, how to get it sorted out. And while I was telling her, she suddenly stopped me in my tracks and uh, said, Jason, Jason, uh, I haven't dialed your home phone number. She said, you live in Folkestone, don't you? I said, yeah. She said, I've dialed the folks the prefix, but I've dialed your staff payroll number. It's next to your name on the list at work. And I uh, sort of took, took all this in. And, and uh, basically, you know, that's exactly what happened. Uh, she dialed my staff payroll number, and my staff payroll number just happened to be the exact same number of this phone box that I, I happened to be walking past. <laughs> On the 10th of December 1992, a Thursday morning at half past nine, I'm going to my first piano tuning job. And I'm approaching Fairmile Head on the outskirts of Edinburgh, and I saw this light in the sky, which I first assumed was a halogen spotlight on a helicopter. And a couple of minutes later, I'm coming down Commerson Road, and this light was blazing in the sky. It was so bright, it made me stop the car, and I got out to look at this amber coloured ball. It looked exactly like the rising sun. You know the colour the sun is in the morning if you get up early. And it just sat there roughly the size of a pea in the sky. And then it shrunk down to a wee tiny pinpoint of light and disappeared as though it had shot off in a straight line. Then it came back. And I watched this thing for two or three minutes. And another chap came down the street. He says, what do you think that is? He says, it's not a plane. It's not a helicopter, and we both kind of hummed and hayed, and nobody said one way or another what we thought it was. So eventually I says, well, aliens or not, I says, I've got a piano to tune, and off I went. Mm -hmm. 